Kappa, everyone. Um, my name is Kat Poise, and I'm very pleased to be the um, host of this next panel about what it means uh, and who gets to walk like an academic. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have Tara joining us in the spotlight soon with the video, maybe? I think my um, voice is working, but just not my video. So, uh, um, yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Glad, glad to have that. Um, uh, right, so uh, just to jump off, and because I'm aware that our times have um, all been a bit truncated, so we can hopefully avoid the d uh, dreaded Zoom fatigue, I'm going to go ahead and invite the members of the panel to introduce themselves uh, and to speak really briefly as to what academic freedom means to them. Should I go first? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so tēnā koutou katoa, ko aia hau, ko maunga haumi, tōku maunga, ko aia pāua, tōku awa, ko horauta, tōku waka, ko te aitanga, māhaki, tōku iwi, ko te whanoa, taupara, tōku hapu, ko takipu, tōku marae, um, ko Tara McAllister hau. Um, so kia ora everyone, I just wanted to start with acknowledging all of those who spoke yesterday for the really interesting kōrero, um, my fellow panellists today and the organisers um, of this conference. So I wanted to start by sharing a little bit about my kind of positionality and who I am. So I'm a Māori woman, I'm a mother, I'm a baby academic compared to many of you. Um, I'm a member of, a, of the precariat as I'm employed in a fixed term part-time contract. My pronouns are she, her and ia. Um, my PhD was all about toxic cyanobacteria. So technically, um, I'm a freshwater ecologist by training, so I kind of don't subscribe, subscribe to Western ideas of, of disciplines, which kind of function to combine the research that we do. Um, so I'm really driven by doing research that I consider to be impactful, and, and I note that this is significantly different from what the academy um, perceives to be impactful. And here I speak as someone who has lived experience of being excluded um, and at times silenced within universities despite academic freedom, but also someone who is doing and has done both qualitative and quantitative um, research around racism in the academy. So what is academic freedom to me? I just wanted to mention a couple of things which I haven't heard um, talked about previously. So I really think that who is allowed academic freedom is influenced by the underlying and embedded structures within universities. So these are things like racism, sexism, transphobia, and ableism. And they really just decide who can and who can't speak. Another thing I think is important to mention is the space between academic freedom and hate speech. Um, so I really think that when a something is being said about a group of people that is harmful to a certain different group of people, then I don't think that should be covered under academic freedom. Academic freedom should not give grumpy old white professors a free pass to being racist. And, and when I think about in the context of the listener letter, which has been mentioned a lot, some um, academics within Auckland Uni labelled this as a healthy, a healthy debate. Um, but I don't think debating someone's humanity in existence could be defined as a healthy debate. Um, and I'll just end with a quote by a Māori um, scholar and thinker, Brooke Tohiariki, and she said, debate my ideas, not my existence. Kia ora, Tara. Um, Mālo le soi fua. Um... Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Jermaine is the name. I'm the co-head of school for Te Wānanga Waipapa, School of Māori Studies and Pacific Studies uh, within the Faculty of Arts, and also one of six members to the inaugural Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission. Um, I hail from the villages of Salulonga, Waimoso and Tanga, and I'm a New Zealand-born Samoan. And academic freedom to me, um, I believe everyone has a right to it, but there's a fine line. Obviously, 
around the acceptability of what's being spoken about and the platform that's being used, um, which is not necessarily so clear cut. Um, however, I consider that we have a responsibility, as Tara mentioned, we have a responsibility in that we cause no further harm. And I think that is ultimately that's key. And so the question I consider is that in terms of academic freedom, who is setting the rules and who are the gatekeepers? And they certainly aren't people that sound or look like me. So I'll pass it on to you, JJ. Kia ora. Thanks, Jemima. Thanks, Tara. Um, so kia ora, everyone. Dana Koto Katoa. Uh, my name's uh, Jan or JJ Eldridge. I prefer both now. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, them, they. Um, I'm originally from the UK, but I've been in New Zealand now nearly 10 years. Um, I'm a non-binary trans woman, um, just because it makes it easier not have to worry about exactly who I am <laughs> and where I fit into gender space, because it's really complicated to try and understand that. Um, I'm an astrophysicist, and so I've got this great line that, you know, I, I study exploding binary stars while trying to explode the myth of a gender binary. Um, and I'm the current head of department of uh, physics at the uh, University of Auckland. Um, and what's academic freedom to me? I just want to actually basically copy what has already been said by Tara and Jemima about how I don't necessarily define academic freedom doing what it is, but it's where the limits are. And um, Tara said it very well, you know, it's not an excuse for professors to be racist. Um, because I'm transgender, I know that there are people who uh, use academic freedom to um, allow attacks on trans people you know, and basically to attack my rights and basically say that I'm not a person because I'm trans. And all that actually means is that um, my uh, gender does not align with the sex I was assigned at birth, um, which is kind of peculiar because it suggests that, you know, a doctor who looked at me for 30 seconds just after I was born knows me better than I know myself after the last 40 odd years. Um, and what's actually interesting is when you do look at those articles that attack uh, trans people, like the um, thing I discovered yesterday from Jill talking about what actually is in the act, it's basically there's no academic rigor in their arguments. You know, their entire academic integrity and the way you reference certain articles to build up your article and have evidence sort of like suddenly evaporates because there is no evidence for their point of view. Um, so that's where I'm trying to define academic freedom because that's where I think where the limit is is much more um, interesting to try and define it than what's actually where it actually is. So Kira, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those great introductions and that nice kind of uh, framing um, of how each of you kind of approach the topic of academic freedom. Our panel's a, a little bit different or has a different slant uh, than a lot of what's been talked about over the last day and a half because we wanted to look at like who is and who isn't allowed academic freedom. Um, so I'd love to turn it back to the panel um, to uh, have that conversation. Who is allowed to speak? with academic authority uh, in our current society. I, I can probably start there. Sorry, everyone. I still can't turn my um, video on, but I guess I wanted to flip back to something that Dr. Sidiana Naithi mentioned yesterday. So she talked about how Pacific academics comprise about 1% of professors in New Zealand universities. Um, and I'd like to kind of present the inverse of that st statistic, which is um, that about 71% of New Zealand professors employed, and this is data from 2018, 71% um, were men, 71% were European, so that's both Parker, New Zealander, um, and identifying as European from other countries. Um, and out of, out of all professors, all genders and ethnicities that, that data is collected for, 51% of the total numbers of professors identified as both men and European. So that, I think those numbers kind of give us an indication of how overwhelmingly white um, and masculine the university um, kind of academic workforce is. So when we're thinking about what what an academic looks and sounds like, that's kind of the the overwhelming um, majority. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd want to echo what Tara's mentioned and that, you know, <laughs> you, you could probably count on one hand how many academics sound and, and look like me and all that. 
exaggerating, but you know what I'm saying. I guess the grapple is navigating those colonial structures and set against our own uh, values and beliefs, and often those that are on the periphery don't necessarily fit the Western modes or models and ideals. And so going against that conventional grand end, it may <clears throat> be seen as stepping outside the rules or going rogue, and not everyone necessarily likes change. And for those underserved populations in the academy, um, you know, a lone voice is not necessarily the loudest. And I find that the challenge is oscillating between in and between those spaces where you haven't historically belonged and establishing that belonging as a brown Pacific woman in the academy. The thing I'm going to add here is that, um, you know, it's interesting with the statistics that Tara brought up because I basically transitioned from being a man to a woman. And so you have this really interesting viewpoint on like how what I'm allowed to speak on with academic authority has changed over time. And so, you know, back when, before I transitioned, I would get asked a lot about, you know, talk about astronomy and science, because that's really cool, right? And that's what my field is. Um, but now it's like I've transitioned to a woman. I get invited to talk like in panels like this about academic freedom, where I have quite a lot of imposter syndrome, because I never really considered this before I transitioned. And so it's interesting to come in and listen to so many interesting talks and so many viewpoints about everything to do with academic freedom from that aspect. But also I suddenly have this lots of requests to talk about trans inclusion, right? How do you change your company or your academic, or your academic environment to make it welcoming for trans people? And so suddenly just because I'm a trans person, I, I, I can speak. <laughs> and it's just like, but I know I can't. And I always make the point that, you know, I'm one trans person. And actually the great thing is that there's so other few people in the rainbow community. I, you have to now talk for the entire rainbow community when you know intersectionality is a thing right so that's um great um although the interesting um yeah that's what i want to say i think the one other thing ah was i was going to say is you can also see this in the media it's like who's allowed to speak by the people that you get invited to speak on telly um and one interesting thing that is kind of funny is um you know that you have people like Michael Baker talking about the academic and COVID-19 because that's his profession. And then you have Sean Hendy who's talking about it because of the work that Sabrina Martini have been doing with the academic. But he's a physicist. And so it's just something out of the strange. It's like, do the subject matters you study actually also give you some weight in what you're saying? Are oh, we joined by Tara? Hi, Tara. <laughs> um, we're joined by... Um, uh, you know, so it's, like, it's also something that I've noticed, like physics and astronomy privilege, because I talk so much about astronomy, I can distract people by saying, oh, look, we're talking about pretty astronomy. And then I can come back and point out to them, right, you know, we, you're accepting that the universe is very difficult and complicated, but well, it turns out people are complicated too. And it's just something that, you know, we don't normally think about when who's talking about academic authority. It's this, our subject we do actually does give people a lens onto what we can talk about. So if there's an idea about like what an academic looks like, at least especially here, if we're talking about our own culture in terms of who dominates in those spaces, who's asked uh, to speak on what topics, who's invited onto the media to make comment, what are then kind of the costs for individuals such as yourself who don't fit into, you know, that idea of what it looks like? what cost do y'all um then have to pay to engage in your academic freedom or what risks are there for you when you when you want to do that should i go first again um i think for me speaking on my own personal experience there's there's a really massive risk to speaking out as a maori woman um i think the levels of risk associated with with speaking out depend on who you are the position you hold within the academy and what you're speaking out against so for example i think if you're a maori woman speaking about racism within universities themselves then i think you're going to be at a much higher risk than say a white um, man who's a professor speaking about a, a topic that doesn't necessarily bring the university um, into disrepute i think for me one of the one of the costs of speaking out um, and 
being a critic in conscience is that I think that my advancement within the academy um, and my trajectory will be limited and change. I think that I'll have a black um, mark next to my, my name. I'm, I'll be perceived to be a troublemaker or an angry Māori woman um, who often tells people to fuck off on Twitter. Um, but like many Māori scholars before me, I think you know, I'm really willing to sacrifice my advancement within the academy if it means that it's slightly easier for the next generation um, of Māori scholars. And I think, in, you know, there's one hand it, it limits employability, but I think when you're speaking out against racism, um, there are also kind of bigger, bigger threats. Um, in terms of safety. So I don't wanna kind of go into too much detail what the ramifications of academic freedom have been for myself and my family, but uh, it's kind of varied in, in severity from emails from a particular vice chancellor who have tinkered on the edge of bullying um, to having to have um, harassment orders against white supremacists and needing, needing home security. I wanna, kind of speak a little bit to the, the letter to the listener and the seven professors. So they said that their thoughts um, were covered by academic freedom and that they were invoking their role as the critic, critic and conscience of society. Um, but despite this, they had no expertise in, in Matauranga Māori. And, and to kind of give a little bit of a contrast between academic freedom for a certain range of uh, group of people and academic freedom for another group. Um, in response to that letter, I and others organized a celebration of Matauranga Māori on campus. Um, there was to be no mention of the letter or the authors directly. We had organized food. Um, we had senior Māori and Pacific scholars had agreed to speak with poets. So it was just going to be a really great celebration of Matauranga Māori and so the, the seven authors of the letter were allowed to publish that letter under academic freedom, but I and others were not allowed to do this on event on campus. Um, so I was directly told by the Dean that this event could not go ahead. So it's just an interesting contrast to think about who academic freedom applies to and who it doesn't. Yeah, and it is a, you're, you're right, Tara, it is getting used to being unpopular, um, which most often attracts like trolls and, and diatribe. Um, I usually give my family a heads up um, if something I may say may be controversial um, to others, um, just in respect for that, because I represent not just the institution or, or my faculty, but, you know, first and foremost, my family, um, my community. Pacific communities and so forth. Um, it, it, it is a long haul when you are given a platform to a certain extent and, and one needs to develop a certain grit and resilience. Um, I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank, thank Barry um, and TEU for checking in with me around the time when I received that voicemail, uh, that racist voicemail. I mean, it was it didn't take a rocket scientist to, to establish that that person wasn't entirely of sound mind. But the thing she had to say was something that, you know, myself and others have experienced on the daily in, in, in very subtle ways and in, in, in other ways very quite overt. Um, and so you have those kind of, those challenges um, <laughs> and on top of you trying to, make your way through the uh, through academia and so there, yeah there is a lot of cost and risk and you do wonder whether your academic career may be short-lived because you are standing up against things that um, you don't necessarily agree with and I find myself having that grapple lots and <laughs> lots yeah quite a lot um because at the end of the day you are an employee of an organization and you did sign a contract and <clears throat> but at the same time, um, I refuse to be gagged if it means that it's, you know, containing the values, beliefs and perspectives of, of say, Pacific academics and Pacific students and families. Uh, 
Um, yeah, no, I'm just trying to work out how to follow that because, I mean, so again, this goes back to my perspective because back when I was a man, I didn't have to worry about any of this, right? I was the perfect role model of an academic and, you know, I could just carry on tinkering on, but I would have ended up getting really, really unhappy, you know? Um, it, it, it's when you're not yourself, you know, so when I transitioned, I suddenly become really happy. I mean, I was happy before, but there was always something that made me unhappy. But of course, when I transitioned, I knew that then I, I open myself up for these kinds of issues. Not exactly the same because I'm white. So I don't have to necessarily worry about white supremacists. Um, although of course they'll attack me if I support my Mario and Pacific colleagues as I want to do. Um, and also the real problem for me is, so it actually goes back to social media. You know, So on social media, I can't, this is just an example, I can't share the exciting things that happen with my family, right? Because they're a risk, because while I'm, it's not white supremacists I need to worry about, it's the trans exclusionary radical feminists or TERFs. Um, because <laughs> they really don't like trans people and their eventual end game is for us not to exist, right? So there's two bills going through parliament at the moment. One is um, about conversion therapy to try and ban it. And the other one is the birth, death and marriage bill about being able to change um, the gender on birth certificates much more easily than currently there. And there are groups in New Zealand, we're not as bad as say America or the UK, who really are pushing hard on this. And they want to basically not just stop these new rights we're gonna try and get for trans people to come through. They're actually trying to take away all the rights we've already been having and we've had for decades without any problems. So I don't know what the issue is. Um, but also when you're on Twitter, for example, you have to worry about the entire international community because it's just bigger than that. Um, and so there is this uh, security issue, although again, I don't have worries I, I don't have the same issue as Tara. Um, and yeah, and so that is also, I mean, actually now I've seen this from the other aspects. So in terms of other risks um, for people who aren't a cis white man, um, one risk um, that I was thinking about was um, actually, uh, first I was made aware of this by Chanda Prescott Weinstein, um, who's a cosmologist in America. Um, and she came so well known for her uh, work on equity and inclusion. She would always get invited to those talks but no one would invite you to talk about science. And, you know, so I said earlier on how what I'm getting invited to speak on has shifted, um, which is okay because I don't mind doing that kind of education, but it does make you worry that the risk is that everyone kind of ignores your science and thinks, oh no, they're trans, that's their thing, right? Or, or they're, they're black or Maori. And so that's the thing that we can go and learn from them, not all the wonderful science and other stuff you're doing. Um, and also it's actually, uh, Australian and Ivy brought this up yesterday, where she said you have to worry about your line manager, right? Because whatever you're doing, you have to hope that at some point you have a backup of um, your head of department. And so I was lucky when I started to transition, um, actually I'm sure my head of department was very happy that I didn't actually have to talk to him. Um, after I started coming out on Twitter, that's when he said, we need to have a conversation, um, but it was all fine. Um, but the head of department in physics came up to be renewed. And um, I was so worried about the risk of who might become that, not that my colleagues are wonderful, right? But one of the pressing things was, oh, why don't I become head of department? That was a stupid decision, anyway. <laughs> but it's kind of that thing that you have to think about, um, that there are all these little risks beyond just, you know, the big threats to health and safety, which is the main one. But it, it just makes it very stressful when you're thinking about all of these things. Um, I think there was something else I wanted to say, but I can't remember what it is. <laughs> but yeah, so hopefully that's, answer the question i think y'all have given us a, a really nice range of the kind of i mean violence what you're talking about is violence um that uh, people who don't kind of fit that idea of what uh what an academic is supposed to be supposed to look like supposed to sound like might experience um everything from you know pylons um on the internet worries about family to um, as Tara talked about actually needing, you know, actual police protection. Um, while recognizing that our home institutions are often part of the contributors to said violence, would y'all, like, what would you guys say about what responsibility they then, they also have in protecting us, um, protecting us from that violence? I can probably speak to my own um, personal experience of that. And I know Jemima's is quite different. So it'd be great to hear how um, 
how yours has been different, but in terms of when I was dealing with targeted harassment from white supremacists, um, the university was pretty much useless in providing any support or protections to me. So my immediate managers um, were awesome and always have been awesome, but the university really failed, in my opinion, to do anything um, meaningful to support me. And, and one of the things that happened amidst that kind of harassment was that some of the white supremacists started sending um, complaints to the university about me, which were clearly written by, you know, right wing white supremacists. Um, and the university investigated those complaints um, and took them seriously. So I was really disappointed that that so much energy was put into dealing with those complaints rather than the, um, the targeted harassment that I was facing. And interestingly, when the university eventually responded to those white white supremacists who were complaining about me. There was no mention of academic freedom um, or critic and conscience like there was in the defense of the professors who wrote uh, the letter to the listener. So I thought that was a really interesting, um, again, kind of divergence. So they are protected under academic freedom um, and they were being critic and conscience, but I'm not. Yeah, um, you're, you're quite correct in that my experience was was a little different and I, I'm actually quite grateful because I work, I'm based within a faculty that is very proactive in protecting, you know, is quite mana enhancing um, and there's good communication, the art. So I, I worry about those other faculties that don't have that privilege. Um, RNZ checked in um, after my Raising the Bar chat and like I said, TEU. So that was really encouraging. And yeah, I, I felt protected. Although I, I must be honest, I would walk out to my driveway and kind of like take a look down up and down the street. You know, there's that kind of fear. Um, you, you just never know. And the fact that I have to think that way is a little concerning. Um, but what's quite troubling for me um, in the academy is that this is the kind of environment that we are building, nurturing, continuing to perpetuate for our junior and emerging scholars um, who would take one look at this, at what we're experiencing at the moment and, and not want a bar of it. So in terms of building that workforce capacity and the capabilities, um, I do have some concerns around that. I'm, I'm really sorry, Tara, um, for what you're experiencing. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think what I could add because I have no, I have not had to experience anything this bad. I worry about it because I'm quite paranoid just because I try and make sure steps that I never go down there. And again, it's because I, I cheated, right? I did academia on easy mode and then upgraded halfway through when I've got to a point. So when I've got my academic reputation, my skills, then it gives me the ability to be slightly safer. But just to give this the other viewpoint, um, I really worry about this. Being a head of the department and having to deal with these issues from the other side, you know, I, 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 I haven't had to, I'm trying to work out what I can and can't say, right, given everything that's going on in the world at the moment. Um, I worry about this, right, and, and because I listen to people like Tara, I know that if this happens when I'm on watch, I will try and stand up about that. Right, that's I, 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 I'm learning it's very difficult to be in the middle as a head of department because you've got the senior management and you've got the people you actually care about, right? Who are your staff members who you want to succeed, who you're there for. And what I'm still trying to work out is how to try and find the best way to support people like Tara in the future, which is why it's really important for me to be here and to actually listen to these stories, even though I've heard them from Tara before. So, I mean, that's also one of the great things about social media. We heard about all the problems of social media yesterday. Social media is actually also really good because it gives me an opportunity to listen to people who are from normally, um, typically, I'm sorry, historically excluded groups from the, within academia. Okay, and I would not be here actually without social media because I got to meet other trans people and they're like, "Oh, it's okay to be trans." It's not like the most terrible thing in the world. Um, 
so that's uh, something that stresses my mind and so i can't give you advice on like what how this is but i know it's something that really preys on my mind and like what's the best thing for a head of department to do in this kind of situation and so that hr thing i would have at least said if that happened i would have tried at least i don't know hr would be gone probably because they do um but try to make that argument that you know we know this is a white supremacy we know that this is a attack and it's just because it's against a postdoc that's not employed on a on a fit or is employed on a fixed term contract does not mean that it should be treated to how um, a permanent staff member is and so it's it's difficult but i mean i, I know that this entire situation all to do with white supremacy from campus is being looked at and you know it's i think the university has not knows that it hasn't done what it should do and it's grappling with it and i hope i can help to try and make it better which is one of the good things about being a leadership role you can try and make these changes but sometimes it's just what is it what who is the um like rolling something it's the long road right we'll, we'll get there eventually hopefully I mean, I think we can all probably agree that the University of Auckland has an awful track record uh, when, it, when it comes to dealing with white supremacy on its campus. Uh, and, you know, Jan, while I agree with you that, you know, it's a road we're on and hopefully we'll get there, uh, you know, for me personally, it's like, how are we not there yet? Like how much longer, you know, we're not there for Tara. We weren't there for Tara's mother, for Tara's grandmother, for Tara's grandmother. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, in recognizing, I mean, I would absolutely 100% argue that it's our institution's responsibility uh, falling under a lot of different things, including health and safety, to ensure that they actually have policies in place around um, protecting their, their academic staff members when they come under, you know, uh, situations of violence and whatnot for exercising their academic freedom. And that's something that I've been trying to get my own university at Massey to do for years. Um, I was really excited when they were finally pulling together the social media policy because I had kept talking about this, especially with social media. And then of course that policy ended up just being about how massy branding was gonna be used in social media. So my fight in that space continues, but if we, in acknowledging that the core responsibility should be with our institutions, if we then also ask what are ways we can support each other? What are ways that the union can help support us? What are, you know, maybe suggestion or advice you might give uh, to, other emerging academics or academics who are just now kind of coming into more public spaces with their work. What what might y'all say to that? Can I just jump in one thing? But what, what I'm planning to do is also to look with what I can do immediately within physics. So I'm not gonna think about, I know the university's out there, but one thing we've been doing reasonably well is making changes in physics and then the rest of the faculty at least trying to start copying those. So that's what i can do and actually that's the one thing if everyone's wondering what can i do about this change your own department first then worry about the university and it will it's that hopefully going roots up is one way of doing it anyway sorry um i i think we need to see realize the potential of our emerging academics um and not feel threatened by that potential um, I also wanted to draw upon the fatigue of pulling, I'll, I'll speak from my own experiences, from pulling, a, say, a Pacific woman into many, many spaces. There's a fatigue around that and having to educate others. Um, you know, it's not, thanks for coming to my TED talk, but um, in the end, you're like completely drained. Um, when I think what needs to really happen is that stop asking us the questions and what needs to be done, put us at the tables, you know. Hop out, out of your seat, let us sit in that seat, give us the space because we have the answers. And um, sometimes it's really good to, like, say in an organisation like TU, to have dedicated specific spaces to be able to talk about our own issues and how they can be addressed. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, total call that, um, those for Card or Jemima. I think one thing I would really like to see is that I always kind of rattle on about is co-leadership. So at every level within universities, if there was a Māori person um, 
for every you know Pākehā or Tauiwi, HOD, um, all the way up to Vice Chancellor, I think that could really have some transformative change into how things occur within universities. And I just wanted to quickly address a comment about um, cancel culture <laughs> that's popped up. So I don't think that a lot of the things that have happened, um, you know, the listener letter, for example, are necessarily cancel culture. I view that as accountability. I'm just going to double up with what Tara just said. Cancel culture is just basically, I, I really, basically on one side, there's people who are just having a debate. And on the other side, you'll actually have people who just want their rights to live. And so that's not cancel culture. That is, it, it, it's, it's, you see this time and time again, and people were attacking woke culture and cancel culture. And um, no, we're just trying to fight back. <laughs> and actually, no, I don't want to say fight back too aggressive. I mean, just want to live and not have to deal with this shit. And be able to live with our full humanities without having to debate that or, yeah. yeah. Our, I mean, you're, you're debating our existence <laughs> and, and putting us on a par of being subhuman, um, which that, that, that's what happens when you try and debate these things. I think we also, too, um, in, in positions of leadership, we need to check ourselves because it's very, very easy to slip into um, place, you know, privilege yourself and you can quite easily become blinded and, and lose, you know, um, lose track of, <laughs> of your vision and, and what you're meant to be doing. But I, but I do consider being in leadership um, that you do get a sense of... I don't know how to say this without sounding um, not power, but there is some, you know, there is a way that you can navigate those spaces for, you know, the next generation coming through, and you you are you are grappling. <laughs> you you're living these multiple life um, lifestyles, I guess, on the daily. Yeah. I just wanted to add something about. Um that kind of, the, the comments are cracking me up. Um, but I just wanted to add something about that kind of extra energy that it takes to, um, to kind of educate non-Māori, non-Pacific people about some of the, the racism um, and sexism and other isms that we experience. And some of the people in that I spoke to yesterday were kind of quite shocked and taken aback by some of these experiences. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that Māori and Pacific people have been writing about this since forever. Um, so I really encourage those who are shocked by hearing um, some of these things to engage a little bit more in, in the literature that's already out there. Um, you know, look up Professor Joanna Kidman's work about how people are, are marginalized in the academy. Like, this is not new. This has been going on forever. That's such a lovely place to wrap up um, that I'm, unless any of the other panel members have something that they really want to say before we close, I'm quite happy to, to wrap it up on that final comment from Tara. Excellent. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I, I want to thank uh, everyone participating who's been listening today. Uh, there's been a lot of really interesting comments uh, and questions in the chat. It looks like there will definitely be good further discussion about this later today when we're able to break into um, uh, into our, our breakout rooms and our, our discussion groups. Of course, I want to, of course, thank the panel themselves. Um, when I reached out uh, to, to, to these three women and said, hey, <laughs> I have this idea and I'm, I'm hoping that, that you'll be keen to join me. I honestly had underestimated how awesome this was going to be. This was really great. So uh, thank you very much to Jan, to Tara, um, to uh, Jemima, and um, hope to see the rest of you throughout, throughout the rest of the day of the conference. Turning it back over to Heather. <laughs>